Bruce Dumont back with hour number two. And before we go back with our guests, let me just mention that uh, uh, Ron Babcock of Chicago, he's a regular uh, listener and viewer of the program. Uh, he wrote this note, which I just want to put on the record. Should Rittenhouse have let the crazed criminals set arson fires, destroy property, threaten anyone who wasn't one of them, and loot stores, even though his father, grandmother, and friends lived there, and he worked there? Should Kyle have just stood there, watched, and done nothing like the people that witnessed the murder of Kitty Genovese did? And then he asks, doing nothing only encourages and emboldens evildoers. So my question to everyone is, this is the opposite side of whether or not this encourages vigilantes. I mean, this is some guy who uh, went out and did something and uh, is paying a price for it, although he's not going to prison. That's the question. We welcome uh, to this microphone, uh, we welcome Eric Zorn, who for many years was a columnist for the Chicago Tribune. He is now an independent uh, blogger. And he's going to tell us about uh, his new venture in just a moment. But also Larry Horst joins us. Eric joins us from Chicagoland. And Larry Horst, who is a longtime operative, Republican conservative operative in the city of Chicago, joins us from his uh, retirement palatial home in Florida. And uh, he joins us as a conservative commentator. Gentlemen, you, I think, uh, know each other. So uh, uh, you don't know our in-studio guests, Josh Cantro and uh, Jim Marisi. But uh, we welcome you uh, to this portion of our program. And uh, Eric, I want to begin with you because uh, uh, it was September 3rd of uh, last year uh, where you predicted uh, in writing a column for the Tribune that you thought that Kyle uh, Rittenhouse would be found not guilty. So I guess you weren't surprised by the result the other day. But uh, why did you think it was going to happen a year ago and uh, your reaction to it uh, tonight? Well, I thought the verdict was accurate in terms of its application of the circumstances and Wisconsin law. Mm -hmm. And anyone who watched the videos, watched carefully those videos and tried not to let themselves be too poisoned by their feelings about uh, <clears throat> lots of auxiliary aspects of that, of the, of the protest and of, mm -hmm. the, of the people who were there guarding the property, could see that self-defense was uh, definitely applied that the Rittenhouse's claims that he was being attacked and was in fear of great bodily harm or death were legitimate. Now that doesn't mean that you got to say like he's a hero or we <clears throat> we want more people with guns going out and and patrolling streets during during chaotic times, but it just seemed like a a pretty obvious the first shooting when he shot Joseph Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum w was running after him, hell for leather, was grabbing for his gun, wasn't stopping. And that's that's self-defense. You know, it's like mm -hmm. and then and then when you've got a bunch of people chasing you down the street, yelling cranium him and kicking at him and, and hitting him in the head with a rock. Uh, he, again, I think there's a legitimate claim that he made and the jury believed and that I believed at the time and still believe, which mm -hmm. was that he felt like he was in fear of death and great bodily harm mm -hmm. and he had a right to exercise self-defense. He also had a right, uh, apparently under Wisconsin law, to be carrying that gun. It was He was carrying it legally, even though he was under 18. But even if he wasn't carrying it legally, he still had a self-defense claim. I thought they were mm -hmm. going to get him on the gun charge that the judge yeah. dismissed. But he, he had the right to defend himself and he was under attack and it, it doesn't matter that it was ill-advised of him to be there walking around with a gun he didn't know how to use mm -hmm. and saying he was a medic when he wasn't all those things are just atmospherics i've heard over and over again from people like he crossed state lines he went up across state lines yeah. well, so what yeah he, he worked in kenosha yeah you know it's like and, the, and the, uh, the way that people are obsessing about minor details in this case and not looking at the facts in evidence and the law and realizing that you don't have to love this acquittal, but it was in accordance with the law. I think the jury made the right decision. I want to come back and follow up on some of your points because some of your uh, progressive uh, fans from years ago, they might have just uh, driven off the road because they might have expected something different. <laughs> but again, we're going to come back. I want to bring in uh, Larry Horace, who spent many years in Chicago. Larry, what is your, uh, I want to kind of focus the question to you on, what do you think happens next? What, what, is, the, uh, what is the lesson learned from the Kyle Rittenhouse trial? 
Well, first of all, I want to say I was surprised by Eric, too, because I totally agree with him. <laughs> and I've written several commentaries predicting he mm -hmm. would get, uh, you know, acquitted based on the hard evidence, the hard evidence. But I think uh, if he had gotten convicted, I <clears> think uh, there would be no such thing as self-defense. It would have been uh, you couldn't have one. So I think this is a you know perfect self-defense case, and all the details overwhelmingly suggest that it was self-defense. I think what we take out of this, or it depends on who you are, I guess, what you take out of it, but I think we can take out of this that the justice system works. You know, when this country saw what happened to George Floyd, everybody, Republicans, Democrats, everybody saw what happened, and we got a conviction. Everybody saw what happened. In this case, we got an acquittal. And I think in the every recovery case, we're going to get another conviction. The justice system is not operating on racial grounds. But a lot of people take out of this as this is licensed for some crazies on the right wing to go shoot up everybody. And that's a dangerous talk. What I hear on television I, I'm actually shocked by it. I'm shocked by people who are supposed to be intelligent would be so biased and, and provocative, telling people that they're going to get gunned down now because Rittenhouse got acquitted. Uh, and so what I take out of it is we're moving in a bad direction if that dominates the public discussion. Josh Cantro has a question or comment for each of you. Yeah, I, I would just say, Larry, a, amen to everything you, you said, that uh, it, it really does concern me how um, this case became larger than what it really was, which was just the self-defense case. And uh, folks on the uh, left and, frankly, on the right wanted to make it something else, um, mostly on the left, I would say. And I would just say that, although I've never met Eric Zorn, I've read read his columns for 30 years or however long you were writing them. And as a Republican, I have to say, I'm shocked that I just listened to what you said and I agreed with every word of it. And um, <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll get well, back. Let to me say, I followed Eric yeah. for many years, many years, and I've disagreed with him, but he's also you know, been, a lot of, said a lot of things I agreed with. Yeah, no, he's, he's, a, he's, he's been. Uh, thank you, guys. I, I like to <laughs> think that I, when I look at these things, I, I, I look at them, you know, I try to come at them as neutrally as possible. No. So like, what yeah. are the facts here? What's the law? If you want a fair trial, and, and uh, I think we all want fair trials for mm -hmm. everyone, then you have to apply the law based on the evidence and you can't bring in all this all this other stuff. And, you know, Larry, I don't <clears throat> think I agree with you that the justice system works as well for black people as it does for white people. I, I don't agree with that. But but that doesn't mean that we should give a white guy a crappy trial and and, and judge him on atmospherics rather than on the facts and the evidence. So, the me so, you uh, know, it's somebody the raised media, a good though, point. Though. Why did this trial become so important? Are, are you familiar with Andrew Coffey? Am Andrew Coffey just is a black fellow who just got off on a uh, self-defense. He, uh, he was in a situation, his house was raided. Uh, he sh shot at the police. They shot him. His girlfriend got killed. They charged him with attempted murder and murder in the case of the girlfriend, although she was shot We've by got the a pause. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think everybody's, I don't think everybody's up to date on that. We what, do what, have to no. pause. We've got a pause right now. Everybody no, take no. a breath. We're going to a commercial <laughs> break. I'm Bruce Dumont from coast to coast and border to border and around the world at beyondthebeltway.com. Bruce Dumont back, and uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, during the uh, break, uh, uh, some news came to us about a, an incident uh, involving a SUV uh, driving through a holiday parade uh, in a small uh, Wisconsin town. It was not Kenosha, but uh, Josh and Jim have both looked into it. So, Josh, what, what uh, do you, news do you have on it? Yeah, it says that uh, 20 were injured when an SUV plowed into spectators at a parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Um, it happened at uh, 4.40 local time, which is central yeah. time. And um, the police have uh, confirmed the incident. Um, and it appears that... Uh, 
there is a big investigation going on sure. right now. Jim, anything further that you have? Um, no, uh, there okay. has been no information as to uh, whether this is an act of malfeasance, an act of terrorism, or maybe just somebody losing control of their car. Mm -hmm. Um, it'll remain to be seen, but uh, obviously our thoughts and prayers go out right. to all sure. of those affected. Uh, Eric, I want to go back to you because in the last hour, uh, we were talking a lot about the media coverage and what the media, how the media covered this. As a as a longtime journalist and as a believer in the in the First Amendment, wh what grade would you give your fellow journalists in how they covered the Kyle Rittenhouse? Uh, incident trial uh, for the last year and a half? Well, I, th I thought the mainstream media, I thought the Chicago Tribune, my former employer, the Washington Post, New York Times, presented in their news pages fairly comprehensive reports fairly early on about what happened and what didn't happen there. Uh, I think that the that the partisan media did a very poor job and, and they continue to do a poor job in amplifying irrelevant facts and in, in whipping people up into thinking. Uh, I, I think it was, was it Josh who said earlier that, that this was, it was a self-defense trial. It's a self-defense case. Uh, and that's pretty much all that it was. And a, a lot of the things that got injected in there, a bunch of false, they, they, people kept saying that his mother drove him, drove him and his right. gun to Wisconsin and dropped him off at the protest. Well, it's just not what happened. And, and responsible media outlets we're amplifying this, and I, I could say I don't know why, but I, do, I feel like some of these these media outlets just fell right into their partisan silos and wanted to make more out of this than than should have been made out of it. This was this was a kid who wandered into this protest thinking he was going to be a hero. He found himself under attack. Mm. He used a gun to to ward off mm. that attack. That was what happened here. This wasn't this wasn't some big social thing, and this is why I've been I've been sort of dismayed at the contention that this is a really meaningful case. It was certainly interesting. Yeah. I, I paid as much attention to it as I could, given what other things I'm trying to do. It was interesting, but it wasn't. Eric, let me ask. I don't think it was meaningful. Let, let me ask. What, what is, in in your yeah. view, or how can you comment? And I, I want to get Larry's response as well, but I want to start with you, Eric, because it, it's a media related question. Uh, how has print journalism responded to the expanding interest many Americans have in partisan cable television? As as the as Fox News has grown, and has obviously CNN hasn't grown much, MSNBC hasn't grown much, but although they are a competitor. But if you look at those three, has that caused print journalism? Uh, to react in any way, and if so, what way? I don't think so, because print journalism is in such a, a difficult spot right now financially. So mm -hmm. that it's like you think, well, how are they are they expanding their their opinion coverage? In general, not. In general, we've, we've had we've had we had a whole bunch of columnists, including including me, who left earlier this year in, mm -hmm. in a buyout as the paper is, is shrinking under uh, under the ownership of a hedge fund. So you're not seeing as as much in the way of local opinion offering. Uh, I I don't I think the answer to that question is that that they're not really able to respond to that because they don't have the resources to respond mm -hmm. to that. Um, so you're not seeing a whole bunch of extra you know new columnists coming in or or, or more extreme columnists. I, I don't I don't see that happening. I, Larry, I, what, Larry, what do you think of this? Okay, <laughs> this time I'm going to disagree with Eric. I think there's been a merging of these two. I think the cable television has been drawing print uh, media into the same kind of partisanship and one-sidedness. And what I cite is how many of the Post and the New York Times correspondents aren't contributors on MSNBC and CNN. As a matter of fact, every show has print journalists on it, columnists, you know, and Gene Robinson on, you know, on Morning Joe, all of these people are now getting double payrolls and they're being paid by the cable television while they're being paid by the, uh, the others. And they're getting a lot of notoriety. So you've got guys at the Times like uh, Tom Friedman, who just, I would call him just an outrageous radical. And he now appears on television besides mm -hmm. being in print. And I, I think, think it's back. 
washing into the print uh, journalism. Is is that? But you're talking about Friedman, and you're talking about Gene Robinson, and those, and and all these people. Th- these are pundits. These are opinion writers who are getting extra. My, yeah. I mm-hmm. wish I'd been able to get on that gravy train. When <laughs> yeah, I had a sure, call, me too. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that would have been nice, but but, but they're uh, still with the newspapers. They're still they were they were basically print guys <clears throat> who are now putting one foot in each camp. Josh, well, no, no, Josh no, Cantro. I totally agree, but they, but guys, they Josh has got to start with, and they've been opinion journalists all along. So, Josh, uh, Josh has got to comment. They, are there beat reporters who are doing that? Josh has got to comment. Josh. Yeah, I, I was just going to comment to Eric that um, I, I found his comments insightful, but I, I do dis- disagree, and I agree with what Larry has pointed out, <laughs> and would just ask Eric what he thinks about his uh, former colleague Rex Hupke, who has been writing columns for the past year, basically uh, castigating uh, Kyle and has contributed to a lot of misinformation and basically has called him guilty. I really don't want to get into talking about former colleagues, people I used to work with. Uh, But I I will say that I think some of the partisan commentary on this has not hewed to the facts the way I would have liked of them been you too mm-hmm. and i think some of this stuff about uh that I mean, well here, here's another example of something that I, i've read a lot in a lot in some of the commentary which is kyle rittenhouse had no business being there this is what i heard i've read this over and over mm-hmm. again yeah uh, i don't know if rex wrote that or but i know, I know people have and we've heard it tonight kyle on this rittenhouse show had had as much right to be there he had as much business being there as the protesters who were throwing rocks through car windows and setting fires and dumpsters and so on. He had every right to be there. He had every business to be there. I don't think it was smart of him to be there carrying uh, AR-15 around in a very chaotic zone, but he had every, he had as much business being there as anybody else who was there. Uh, so, I mean, those, those I, I are the would, kinds of things that got, that got uh, said way too much for my taste. And he had strong ties to the community. To the trial. It was irrelevant that he was there. They keep talking about it. But he wasn't even chargeable for being there because it was right. perfectly legal. Right. So those who wanted to pay, they debate that in the court of public opinion where there's no rules of evidence. Uh, that's what's happening. What you see what happened in court was proper. <clears throat> Gentlemen, I, uh, as the court of public opinion judge tonight, let me go to David listening to us in San Francisco, wants to join the conversation. Go ahead. You're on the airline three. Thanks, Bruce. Um, and your guest. You know, I remember the old Joseph Conrad book, The Most Dangerous Game. And mm-hmm. we've got two of those trials, uh, you know, right in this last week. Uh, we've got the Ahmed Aubrey one as well as the Rittenhouse one. Uh-huh. Going out and hunting people, hunting humans. And uh, you remember, uh, you, most of you all are old enough to remember when the James Bond movies came out in the early 60s. Mm-hmm. And the idea that a guy could be given a license to kill. That was a heavy deal, uh, the, the license to kill. And, and so now all of these private guards are demanding a, pri- a license to kill. It's not even a secret agent anymore. It's the security guard down the street. So it just shows, you know, the, uh, the uh, reduction of the uh, human standards and how they're being... Uh, uh, David, where do you where do you get where do you get the evidence that security guards are demanding uh, to be armed and to the teeth? That's that's well, not, I, if that's I, a yeah, phenom- if calling... that's a phenomenon, I've missed it. Has anybody heard? I, I, I've, from... I've never heard of that. I'm calling you from San Francisco, well. and you remember just a couple of weeks ago, everybody was hopped up about the little shoplifting uh, sprees mm, yeah. that people were going through. So now when I go to a Walgreens, I see people armed to the teeth. I see they're packing so much crap, it's just amazing. You mean, you you mean the security that, guards? Yeah. Okay, well, and, we and also know, by the way, the one thing we do know is that in San Francisco, which, again, has received a lot of publicity over the last five years about the deterioration of that city and its public security, but also we know that uh, Walgreens has closed many stores, I think it's over 25 stores, in San Francisco because of the crime. So uh, well, you, live in a, you live in a crime-infested city, unfortunately. It's coincidental to the idea that all of the stimulus money has been cut off and the epidemic continues. 
So it's, it's not just in San Francisco, it's all across the nation that crime sprees are happening because the stimulus money has di- dried up because Mitch McConnell and the Republican stin- skin flints don't want to uh, do uh, okay. some proper resolution to an epidemic, uh, and they want everybody to get out there and get sick and die. Uh, that, that, that is just are, false. You, he is so uh, off base. You are, uh, you are uh, so off little, base. You know, first You're of all, a little you know, out there tonight, uh, we're, we're Dave, talking so about thank you very much criminals. for calling. I mean, we're going to pay them more money so people don't commit crimes. That's nonsense. Al, that's, that's in Lake really Forest, Illinois, let crime. And I want to make this uh, one very ahead. important point. Go ahead, Larry. We have always had the right to use lethal force and self defense fence. It's a thousand-year-old legal tradition. So there's nothing new about that. Guards have it. You have it. I have it. Everybody has a right of self-defense and using lethal, lethal force in those situations. When we come back, we've said hello to Al in Lake Forest, Illinois. We will hear his voice when we return. I'm Bruce Dumont, 1-800-723-8289. Thanks for joining us tonight on Beyond the Beltway. Dumont back, uh, segment seven coming up on Beyond the Beltway. Uh, we're going to take a moment now and let each of our guests who join us via Zoom tonight to take a moment and tell us a little bit about uh, who they are and uh, what they're up to now. Uh, I mentioned uh, Eric Zorn joins us. Uh, again, if you live in the Chicago land area, actually he was syndicated for many years with the Tribune for uh, almost four decades. Uh, but certainly one of the leading journalists in the history of the city of Chicago joins us. He recently left the Tribune, and uh, uh, like everyone else, you're reinventing yourself uh, using the new media. Uh, so, Eric, tell everybody uh, where they can find your, your wit and wisdom these days if uh, they're looking for it. Bruce, I, yeah, I left the Tribune in June uh, when the uh, hedge fund uh, took over, and mm-hmm. I've set out on my own. I'm doing a substack. Uh, it's called the Picayune Sentinel, and Picayune. it's a grab bag every week of commentary on the news and, and other fun stuff. I do a thing on amusing tweets that I find and uh, other things mm-hmm. like that. So, so it's a, sort of like I say it's a grab mm-hmm. bag, the Picayune Sentinel, and uh, just find that online and sign up, and I'll deliver it to you every Thursday morning at 6 a.m. Okay, and they can also look up at Eric Zorn as well, but the Picayune Sentinel, Picayune like the... Newspaper in Louisiana, the Times Picayune. Yeah, the the you know, Times Picayune, exactly. which yeah, does yeah, not exactly. exist anymore. Does not well, it exists within uh, Eric Zorn's journalism. That, that, that's great. <laughs> also, we should mention uh, uh, we go back uh, many, many years to the beginning of this program. Eric Zorn and I, uh, when he was with the Chicago Tribune, uh, but we spent a lot of time and, and for many years you were sort of a very frequent guest on this program. And again, uh, it's been a while, but it's nice to have you back uh, with us uh, via Zoom tonight on Beyond the Beltway. And also a frequent guest on this program many, many years ago. We started 43 years ago, and that's Larry Horst. Uh, used to be a very active uh, Republican in the city of Chicago and uh, is now retired to Florida. But, uh, Larry, tell everybody a little bit about uh, what you're up to and uh, your life of enjoyment in uh, Florida. <laughs> well, first of all, I retired to devote myself to writing. Okay. So I write now about 35 to 50 commentaries every month, wow. uh, mostly for Punching Bag Post, which is an online conservative site. I'm also finishing a book on race in the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. I'm finishing a screenplay. I'm finishing a child's book. Uh, I'm just doing almost all writing right now. Uh, I'm not so active in the political politics mm-hmm. other than what I write about. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I, you know, I miss Chicago. You know, my days heading the city club. And I, I, I always think back on that fight to save the Chicago theater. And I also have to think back at the time I got beaten for mayor by a guy who really was a clown. Right, right. You That's right. You you ran for mayor of the city of Chicago and... Uh, <laughs> Ray Wardingly, the late, the great, I think he's late and great. Ray Wardingly. Uh, <clears throat> but it was nice, nice to have a you real, A real, when I called my opponent a clown, I was not being That's insulting. Right. <laughs> let me, let me ask you this question. I think uh, Eric uh, and everybody will may want to weigh in on this, but certainly um, this case is not, uh, it's it's not about race, but again, many in the media have always tried to, to bring 
race into discussions whenever there's uh, disturbances in the in the country. Uh, Larry, I'm going to share with the audience uh, some things that uh, you were involved in that uh, I think you have a very unique perspective. But uh, you have adopted and you have raised, uh, uh, and your wife, uh, you have raised uh, several African-American children. And I'm wondering, as someone with one. that sense... Not several. Okay, one. Okay, okay, one, sorry. Uh, but, but for a long time, what sensitivity... Oh, would yeah. you bring what sensitivity would you bring to a discussion of race relations uh, and how to make them better in America, given the climate we live in right now? Well, you know, I, I've raised a daughter for what 40, 40 some years uh, as part of this family, and really, you know, intimately part of this family. And uh, she has, you know, uh, gone on to you know great things. And actually, I lost a grandson in, in Afghanistan. Her son was killed in Afghanistan. So I, you know, I'm I'm very empathetic to, you know, what uh, you know the black experience in that. But what I really did is, you know, at the beginning, it was never to a racial thing. Uh, she was a babysitter. She had some problems at home with an abusive stepfather. We had to rescue her from the house, and we basically, you know, made her part of our family. Um, and it's never been a, a race thing uh, in our family. Um, I didn't see a lot of misery in, 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 you know, being that close to someone who's black. Uh, but, but, you know, there was a lot of sometimes humor because, you know, she would point to somebody, you know, she'd say, oh, here comes my dad. And they would all look past me looking for her dad, you know. So there, it, was a, it was an interesting experience, but it, 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 uh, it didn't really have a racial implication to anyone in our mm -hmm. family. And she was embraced and it is embraced and loved by everybody in the family. Eric Zorn, to you, because you've covered this subject uh, over 40 years of journalism, are you optimistic that race relations in this country, are they better than they were 10, 20 years ago? And are they likely to be uh, better in 20 or 40 years from now? I think they are better than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, certainly 30, 40 years ago. I, I think that we have made significant progress in the, in those areas. I think we have a ways to go, but, uh, um, but yeah, it's, it's just, and this is, you know, I got, I have to always preface this by saying this is the experience of a 63 year old white guy looking at, at society and saying this. I, I'm, I'm not probably not the guy to ask about this, but, mm -hmm. but my sense is that although we have ways to go, things are, Improving, I'd, I'd be interested in what the views are around the table here. Jim, what do you think? You know, um, I thought I'm going to get Jim's response and, and I was gonna, uh, Josh's uh, response. Go ahead, Jim. Well, I, I think certainly uh, there are in some areas uh, greater opportunities for people of color. I don't think that exists in all areas. I think that has improved uh, in my lifetime. I'm a little bit older than Eric, um, and yeah, we we have some some ways to go. Um, I think maybe you should, yeah, we're, we're, I think everybody on this panel is uh, are white men, uh, probably in our 60s or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. uh, so other people would obviously have different perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think opportunities have increased. I think, you know, I think our the root of a lot of our problems in this country are more economic than they are racial. Um, it's just my my feeling, my gut feeling. I, I mean, there there are poor blacks in our, in our community, uh, that have uh, more in common with uh, uh, some poor uh, whites and poor rural whites, mm -hmm. uh, city blacks, city uh, <coughs> city um, poor whites and uh, and rural uh, poor blacks. They all have more in common with each other than they do with with you know the couple of lawyers here on the mm -hmm. on the panel or the couple of uh, renowned journalists, um, all of which have had a different experience and. So I, I think the, the issues in our country are, would be better served by addressing them from an economic uh, standpoint than from a color standpoint. And if we, stop, if we ever stop litigating the Civil War, I think we can get on with doing uh, what our uh, responsibility of citizenship requires mm -hmm. and to make this country better. Josh. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to find myself you know, uh, Chris, agreeing with, uh, with, with Jim here. I, I know we had heated debate earlier in the first hour, but... Uh, well, that's because uh, on, you were wrong earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing, of course. No, no, I know. But, but, but I also will, will uh, echo what Eric said about it is like we're a bunch of uh, 
guys in their 50s and 60s uh, who are white guys who are talking about this. And uh, one of the things that I, I want to do is I, I do have some uh, uh, two friends uh, who I consider to be close friends who are black, but I need to expand that. Mm-hmm. I need to expand that a lot. Let's go back to Al in Lake Forest. Al, we, uh, we teased that you were going to be on. What comment do you have? Well, I have a, a question for the uh, attorneys. Sure. Um, and for anybody else who wants to weigh in. Um, uh, since the verdict, um, which, I, which I agree with, um, there has been talk of uh, the families of the uh, deceased uh, people and uh, Greg, Greg uh, however you pronounce his name, the guy who was shot in the arm, uh, suing Kyle Rittenhouse uh, for wrongful death, personal injury. Um, and then there's been some talk of bringing, uh, uh, getting the Justice Department involved and bringing a civil rights action against uh, Rittenhouse. Mm-hmm. So what do the attorneys think of the possibilities of uh, that of that litigation. Okay, but let's start. Let's start with the other. Let's start with uh, Jim. Jim, go ahead. Well, I think there very well may be a mm-hmm. lawsuits in that regard. Uh, Josh expressed his thoughts that there may be some mm-hmm. lawsuits against the media that may come to pass, may not. Um, I, you know, the standards are very, very different in a civil court versus in a criminal court, mm-hmm. uh, and the stakes were much, much higher. So the stakes in in the Kenosha trial that just concluded were, you know, were liberty maybe for uh, for life. Mm-hmm. Um, and nobody goes to jail uh, in the civil courts. Uh, uh, we try to, as best as we can, compensate people who've been wronged uh, uh, with financial compensation. Um, so if Mr. Rittenhouse uh, does receive some type of compensation from some uh, potential uh, uh, defamation case, um, he very well might not hold on to that compensation for very long. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I don't know. Th- th- that's all very speculative. There are two different standards. Beyond a reasonable doubt in criminal case, that's what was applied here this past week. Uh, in a civil case, it is what's more probably true than not true. In the case of the uh, gentleman so who lost his arm when he had his, his arm was uh, blown off by Rittenhouse, uh, he was the one that had the Glock, that brought the Glock to the demonstration or the protest, and he's the one that, again, allegedly, according to the testimony, uh, pointed it at Kyle Rittenhouse's head. Uh, with that as a fact, at least according to the, the final result, uh, would that make it difficult for him to win a case? I need you a know, it dep- I'm, I, I wasn't in court. I haven't yeah. heard the witnesses. I think they were pointing guns at each other uh, at the time. Uh, so I don't know. That's why we have uh, to answer Al's question very, very quickly. Anything is possible. It. We got to wait. Anything yes. is possible. I'm Bruce Dumont back shortly. But I'd like to expand. Bruce Dumont, we are back. Dave in Spokane, Washington. We're going to go with you on line one. Uh, We've only got uh, a few minutes left in this segment, so talk fast, Dave. Hey, thanks for taking the call. Um, As far as winners or losers, yes, there was a winner. The winner was the right to self-defense in the Second Amendment. And people are out there saying, well, your vote matters. If you don't like the result, you need to vote to change things. Vote to change what? You, the the Second Amendment and your right to self-defense mm-hmm. are correct the way they right. stand. There's no changes needed. Um, the other thing is, you know, the freedom of the press we talk about, it affords many protections, and I think it may be a little too many protections of the press right now because the big thing going into that is we need to define what is press because, honest to God, the TV, what you watch on most of these stations, you know, CNN, MSNBC, especially lately, uh, they're just like TV versions of social media opinion. That's all they are. They're not news or press. Uh, I mean, Tim Russert is rolling over in his grave that Chuck yeah. Todd is running that, yep. that uh, show. I mean, this is just craziness. Uh, and the media always wants to make things about black and white, black and white. Even the Zimmerman case. Zimmerman was called a white Latino. I mean, how about report things like, like in the Aubrey case? How about report three men, tr- you know, trailed another person, got an altercation, and shot that person, not three white people and a black person? I mean, that just it incites things even further. Uh, it drives me crazy. And they're talking about 
you're looking for trouble by, by wearing a gun. Well, actually, it's the exact opposite. If you're wearing a gun and you're just walking around, which is your right to do, that should minimize trouble because a sane person does not go after someone when right. has a gun strapped to right. them. I mean, that's just idiotic. The motto here is say that he was looking for trouble. Don't bring a skateboard to a gunfight. <laughs> We've got to move on. Exactly. Let's... <laughs> okay. We're going to go to Thanks. Robert in Sacramento, you know, California. KTKZ. Go ahead, Robert. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I was calling in response to the man who was talking about uh, security guards wanting to arm themselves. Yes. Um, CVS and Walgreens have been closing down pharmacies yeah. in San Francisco because <laughs> of the petty theft laws that have been changed. So if you steal $900 worth of merchandise, you walk out. Even if the cops show up, they, if they caught red-handed, they give you a ticket, which no one ever shows up for. People go. There are stories about people stealing uh, aisle after aisle worth of clothing and Tide Pods and all that, running out the doors with, with shopping carts. They just count up 900 bucks for the stuff, throw it in the car, run like hell. Well, it's happening in Chicago as well. We've we've had a chain of, uh, of purse snatches, more than snatches. I mean, you know, robbery, daylight uh, robbery at major stores. Uh, and, and it all flows Gucci. from these... Um, uh, prosecutors who come in and say, we're not going to prosecute. Edward in line five from Chicago. Go ahead. We're able to get three calls in this segment. Go ahead. Are you there, Robert? Edward, rather. Edward, can you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Okay. So there, there needs to be a, a news blackout on there. You had a, a, somebody attached to the NBC uh, station following the jury. I mean, that's a no-no right there. Well, it was a no-no, and the judge was aware of it, and he reprimanded uh, MSNBC. It was uh, someone that worked for MSNBC, and and you're right. They should not have done that. Uh, but again, uh, in the world of journalism, everybody is trying to get a leg up on, on the competition. So uh, any 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 caution that you would make, uh, Eric Zorn, I want to go back to you and Larry to get your last word on it. Any caution to the media for the future? Eric. Well, I, I would say that when you have a situation like this that is so complicated to remind people that this case, not only was it just a self-defense case, but it was a case with a, a whole lot of, you know, concatenating bad decisions made by a bunch of different people there on that on that scene. Right. And it is it, it's a it's a one off. It's not something that is <clears throat> that is all that meaningful, but it is very important if you're going to be doing stories on this to be to be very factual, explain exactly what happened, exactly what the law is, exactly what the evidence is going to be so that people when, when they do react, you don't have to agree with this verdict to say that you, that that the justice system worked the way it was supposed to mm -hmm. work here. And, and we shouldn't be, be vibrating with anger about it. You can be disappointed, but I don't think there's a cause to be, to be furious about this because I, I do believe that when you do take a look at these facts, that you realize that, yeah, it's not a satisfying thing for a lot of people, but the law was followed and that's the law we have. And, it's, mm -hmm. and the, system, the justice system we have is, is a good one in general. Larry Horst. Right, but I, 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 th I think uh, the media is a huge, huge problem because I think they're, they're, they're perpetuating these false narratives and people believe them. I have friends who are very intelligent. They watch MSNBC all the time and they don't know anything about any of this stuff. They only know the narratives. They know what, the, uh, what I would call the propaganda, the one side, the brief for the prosecution, if mm -hmm. you will, whatever you want to call it. And if you're going to be in journalism... That means you tell the facts and you also give some balance. There's two sides to a story. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you watch something like Joe uh, Scarborough in the morning. He'll have seven, eight, seven, nine, ten people on his show. Every one of them have the same viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. Right. Once in a while, he gets a minor change. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it just, it, you know, I think it's the collapse of uh, television, you know, well, cable news journalism. Well, well on, they, no also, have, they also they also have all all the cable all the cable news is no better. All all all, all let me just say Fox News all, no, Fox News, all minute, the Fox cable, News is infinitely better. All the cable I've studied this. All, all person for person, they will have two sides on during the day. Yes. Now mm -hmm. they've got the you know they got the guys in the evenings you know kind of Tucker. I don't really particularly watch them because I don't like that one sided type thing. But on MSNBC, that's all day. That's what they pass as news. If you watch the news on uh, during the day on Fox, 
you'll get different stories, and they'll often have two legitimately uh, opponents and proponents on the same debate. I I agree, more, I agree I agree I agree so with I, that, I but I I, no, I, I, I I I would agree with that, uh, and I watch them all. But I would say that the other thing that uh, I think everybody should do is everybody has lots of time. They literally have time to take the time. It may be five minutes. It may be seven minutes to have an attorney or some expert on who's explaining the law. Why do we wait so late to find out what the state of Wisconsin, what their law is about carrying a, a weapon? Why do we learn that when we're waiting for the jury verdict? I mean, we should have known that on day two. Because you weren't reading my column. <laughs> well, I know, but I'm saying. I had that in my column well, last Well, I know, year. What, what, yeah, but you, Eric, you my point is, my frustration CNN. is you, <laughs> you, were, you were correct, and columnists have always had the, the permanency to put something like that down. But again, for all the people that make decisions of what goes on those cable channels, for no one, to basically, to, just to have you on and read your column, it doesn't happen. It does not happen. On that note, uh, it is the yeah. Picayune Sentinel. That's for Eric Zorn, if you want to find him. Larry Horst, thank you very much for joining us. Josh Cantro and Jim Marisi. I'm Bruce Dumont. Good night.